no one here or elsewhere would question uh, that immigration is one of today's most vital issues facing uh, not only us in the United States, but uh, really all of us throughout the world. And yet, too much of the discussion seems to be carried on in sound bites and bumper stickers. One aim of the initiative then, this year-long initiative on immigration, is to consider the various dimensions of immigration from a wide range of perspectives. To this end, we've invited some of the world's authorities on immigration to join us on campus. And again, if you take a look at the flyer or if you check the Center for Advanced Studies uh, website or the website for women and gender and global perspective, uh, you'll find a complete listing of these and you can uh, find updates as well. Alejandro Portes uh, visited us uh, recently from uh, Princeton uh, and Nancy Foner, um, a world-renowned ethnologist and historical anthropologist of immigration, will be speaking at our next event, which is 4 p.m. on October 7th at Spurlock Museum. Nancy will be comparing the current immigration with the last mass immigration at the turn of the 20th century. On November 3rd, Paul Zaleza will be visiting us to discuss African diasporas in the past, and in the present. Another inspiration for this initiative, however, was our own campus community, which includes not only dozens of scholars of immigration who you will be hearing from throughout the academic year, but also hundreds and hundreds of students and colleagues from immigrant backgrounds. We recognize these people as great resources to us in the conversation that we hope they will all join in throughout this year. Too often, I think, immigration is discussed only as a problem. We would like to draw attention to the fact that it is also a great resource. To our society, it's true, but also to our own university community here at Illinois. And I think you'll hear the chancellor address that issue in a moment. Today's program is intended to raise some of these issues in a novel way through food. I would like to introduce each of our panelists uh, very briefly uh, and ask them to just rise briefly so that I can identify them to you and you'll know who you're dealing with here today. Following our program here, we invite everyone to join us for uh, a rather elaborate array of ethnic, ethnic foods one floor below. Chancellor uh, Richard Herman uh, is a mathematician uh, by background, uh, received his PhD at Maryland. Uh, he served as vice chancellor for academic affairs and provost here for seven years before becoming chancellor. He came to Illinois uh, from Maryland, but also uh, uh, served as an, as an administrator uh, elsewhere at Penn State uh, as chair of their department um, of, computer, of mathematics there. In his years at Illinois, Dr. Herman has led the campus in successfully expanding the funding for research and increasing the diversity of our campus community, both faculty and students. I invited the chancellor here today, though, uh, for a different reason. Uh, I read and was moved by a lecture that he gave uh, to a group of uh, government officials on immigration, expressing, among other things, his own personal feelings on the subject. Chancellor Herman and his wife Susan are active in the Champaign-Urbana community, and we are very grateful to the Chancellor for taking time out to be with us today. I think everybody knows you, but I still want you to stand up so people can see you. Thank you. Uh, professor Martin Manilanson is an old friend, uh, associate professor of uh, anthropology, but also director of the Asian American Studies program. Uh, Martin's a uh, uh, sociocultural anthropologist uh, specializing in sexuality and gender within global and transnational contexts. His first book, Global Divas, Filipino Gay Men and the Diaspora, is a critical ethnography of Filipino gay immigrants uh, living in the New York City area. His other interests include food, modernity, and modern life. He's presently working on 
uh, a project that examines the politics of the senses in relation to race and Asian American culinary cultures in New York City, as well as a project uh, about uh, queer color activism and neoliberal uh, politics. Uh, Martin's also been involved in the past in AIDS prevention and education uh, projects. Uh, he has his AB from the University of the Philippines and his PhD in social anthropology from the University of Rochester. And I wanted to make sure I mentioned for students that get interested in the topic today, my son recommends Anthropology 209. Food, Culture, and Society. Uh, and I'm going to ask Martin to stand up briefly so everyone sees him. Our third speaker I've mentioned already, Professor Jorge Chapa, he has a, an appointment in sociology, but he's also director of the Center on Democracy in a Multiracial Society. He holds an MA in biology, I was very surprised to hear, uh, with honors from the University of Chicago and um, uh, a couple of MAs and a PhD from Berkeley in demography. His publications reflect his interests on policy issues pertaining to Latinos and other groups with low income and educational levels. His latest book, Apple Pie and Enchiladas, Latino Newcomers in the Rural Midwest, uh, was published by the University of Texas Press in 2004, and I would certainly recommend it. It was nominated for the uh, Senior Book Award uh, of the American Ethno Ethnological Society. Uh, as I mentioned, um, Jorge's book was in part at least the inspiration for today's uh, program. And batting cleanup, uh, we have Amy Gaida, and I'll ask her to r rise in a moment, but even if you don't recognize Amy Gaida's face, you are likely to, recommend, are likely to recognize her, her voice. Um, she's a member of the bar in D.C., uh, Virginia, and Maryland, uh, but she's also here, assistant professor of journalism and law. Uh, her book, The Legalization of Academia, is under contract with Harvard University Press and explores the growing resort to litigation and academic controversies and the implications of this for academic freedom and for university autonomy. Uh, what I was referring to is um, Amy regularly um, does uh, spots on public radio. The, um, I've lost the name of the uh, legal issues in the news, uh, which is always a nice way to start the day. You're going to find that um, her commentary is not only incisive but also very humorous. Uh, and uh, we're, we're really delighted to have her with us today. You won't be surprised to learn that uh, Amy has a background in broadcast journalism. She, she was a reporter and producer, among other things, for a long time before she became uh, a law uh, professor. By academic standards, uh, as I say, her presentations are unusually uh, concise, which is something that a chair always appreciates at a program like this, uh, and uh, also very entertaining. Um, they never fail to start me off uh, on a good foot each uh, time I hear them. So I'm going to ask Amy to rise briefly so you, you, see, you see that face to go with the, with the name. The, the program of presentations is planned to be relatively short. We expect to uh, um, uh, have you listen uh, a bit for about 40 minutes or so. Uh, we'll open the floor at that time for any questions or discussion you might have. Uh, but let me remind you again about the food. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure this is this, uh, the next 40 minutes or so is going to be very edifying, but if you skip the food, you'll, you'll be sorry. So I think we'll begin with uh, Chancellor Herman. I think there's one, one more person left to thank, uh, Jim Barrett, uh, putting this, helping put this thing together. It, it, it is, as he notes, uh, uh, one of the most important topics uh, facing this country. Uh, and uh, I, I'm struck by its absence in the campaigns. But uh, I guess we have to settle for the answer that uh, 
people are running campaigns and not running administrations. Uh, it's not a very good answer, but uh, it's nevertheless the case. Uh, and hopefully, uh, whoever gets elected will emerge with this on, on their agenda. This is a subject uh, near and dear to my heart. Immigration is as American as well enchiladas and apple pie. Immigration is also in my DNA. So I, I don't pretend to be a, a scholar of immigration, except I, I work hard at trying to learn about it because I do have a story to tell. And uh, so if you will, much of this is a, a personal reminiscence. My mother's parents came to America in the early 1900s during the largest wave of immigration in our history. At that time, some 15 million immigrants made the journey from Europe to the United States. They came from Turkey, Lithuania, Hungary, Austria, Greece, Italy, and Romania. And like my grandparents, they came from Russia, part of a mass exodus of Jews escaping a pogrom in that country. When they arrived at Ellis Island, America was approaching an historic high water mark for the percentage of foreign-born residents. Between 1910 and 1915, fully 15% of America's population was from somewhere else. North of here, in Chicago, four out of five new residents, four out of five residents were new arrivals. They were not welcomed with open arms. In the prestigious Atlantic Monthly, Francis Walker wrote, and I quote, the problems which so sternly confront us today are serious enough without being complicated and aggravated by the addition of some millions of Hungarians, Bohemians, Poles, South Italians, and Russian Jews. Walker's complaint came at the crest of a wave of anti-immigration, and the complaints are not dissimilar to today's complaints. If you know your Chicago history, you will remember Haymarket Square, where in 1886 a bomb exploded during a labor rally organized by immigrants. The Haymarket bombing triggered a national wave of fear. Foreign birth and foreign customs were equated with terror. Sound familiar? In Chicago, hundreds of socialists, anarchists, and other radicals were rounded up. Eight anarchists, all but one of them German immigrants, were indicted for conspiracy, though none was charged with throwing the bomb. After a conspicuously biased trial, seven were hanged. The eighth was given a long prison sentence. Into this maelstrom of anti-immigration came my grandparents, my family, my DNA. This is my history, and I am proud of it. I often try to imagine how disoriented my grandparents must have felt in their first years in America. What harsh words were said to them did they hear the taunt printed on a t-shirt that you can buy today outside the Port Authority bus terminal in New York City? Welcome to America, now speak English. Did they hear the worst that a fear of strangers often evokes? But I more often think, like to think about the excitement they must have felt. For America was not just a new country with a new culture and language. It was a payoff on the promises of new opportunities. Whatever dreams my grandparents must have had, the first sight of the, this promised land must have created some dreams they didn't even know they had. Today, another historic wave of immigration is washing over the United States. Around 35 million people living in this country, or 11%, were born elsewhere. If the current rate of immigration continues, we will certainly surpass the record of 15% foreign-born set 100 years ago. Believe me, this is a good thing, not only for our country, but for this university, too. I will tell you why in a short while. In fact, you may note that uh, this university has been, in the Chicago Sun-Times, uh, pilloried as having the most international students of any other University, public university in the country. I tell you, I'm enormously proud of that. We, almost, we have almost 69,000 foreign-born servicemen and women 
serving in our armed forces, 5% of active duty military personnel. More than 11,000 of them are women. No one seems to have a problem with this. Well, two decades after my grandparents first saw Lady Liberty's torch in New York Harbor, Congress passed the Immigration Law Act of 1924. Though the act encouraged immigration from Western and Northern Europe, it placed strict quotas on the number of Italians, Irish, Jews, Japanese, and other ethnicities that many white Protestants, Protestant Americans, considered inferior. Much of the debate centered on questions of national identity, race, and ethnicity. In California, voters passed a law forbidding Japanese land ownership. In Georgia, candidates won national office by rally against the evils of Catholicism. Wealthy businessmen launched a national propaganda campaign against Jews, against my grandparents. Mobs in Illinois stoned Italian immigrants and burned their homes, and the Ku Klux Klan again reared its ugly head. In the 1930s, immigrants slowed to less than a trickle, not because of the passage of the Immigration Act of 1924, but because of the Great Depression. With no jobs available, people simply stopped coming to the United States. In fact, during this period, more people left America than came home. But during World War II, America became a safe haven for many of Europe's intellectual elite, people like Albert Einstein, who were fleeing Nazism, communism, and war. The contributions of these immigrants cannot be overstated. Many joined the faculty of our nation's leading universities pursuing fundamental research, sharing their knowledge with American students, and elevating American universities to unprecedented levels of prestige. Former president of Harvard, James Conant, led the charge to pull American academia out of its parochial stasis and tapped into the rich intellectualism and talent of post-war Europe. From that point forward, the United States began to have world-class universities. Recently, I gave a memorial for a longtime faculty member many of you knew, Ladislav Zagusta. This great scholar was born in Czechoslovakia and survived two occupations of his native country, including the Nazis. While I was delivering remarks for this memorial, I could not help but think Professor Zagusta came here to this campus and community with his stories, sorrows, scholarship, and hopes. And I thought again of my grandparents. Professor Zagusta's story is the ultimate immigrant story, the eternal story all of us in the United States share through our own lives and those who came before us. And as is well noted by now, the influx of immigrants, that scattering of seeds in the wind, if you will, that came to our shores after World War II took our universities to the premier level they hold today. Yet if you will allow me a lament, this seems to be a time when many in our country do not want to remember and celebrate all that others have brought to this country and continue to bring. And that saddens me greatly, for if we forget Professor Zagusta's story, then we forget our own story too, and we cannot afford to do that. This is the reason we must continue to keep our doors open and welcome the many international students and faculty members who come here today temporarily or permanently seeking their future on our campus while enriching us with their very presence. We are and must always be a global campus. We must prepare our students to be citizens of the world. That's what we do so well at Illinois and exposure to people from all corners of the globe are essential to the education of all of us. Newcomers developed many of the technological innovations that have driven our economy during the last two decades and they continue to do just that. Many of these foreign-born entrepreneurs came here to study at American universities and decided to stay. Jerry Yang, one of the co-founders of Yahoo, emigrated from Taiwan. Google co-creator Sergey Brin was born in Russia. Hotmail co-founder Sabir Bhatia was raised in India. Our own Illinois graduate and inventor of the revolutionary online payment service, PayPal, Max Levchin was born in Kiev, Ukraine. When the Soviet Empire broke apart, Max's parents moved the family to the city of broad shoulders, Chicago. 
would Max have been able to reach his amazing potential in Ukraine? At the same time, who are we not admitting to the United States? What talented young man or woman cannot get to our shores? Illinois is one of the leaders in the country in numbers of international students who study at the graduate level. They help fill this country's paucity of graduate students in science, math, and technology. Our universities are still the best in the world, but globally our 15-year-olds are tied for 21st place in average academic performance. In 2003, American eighth graders ranked 14th in math and eighth in the world in science. Somewhat as a result, great universities across the nation, like Illinois, continue to rely on these students to do research and help global prob solve global problems in areas such as energy and the environment. And ladies and gentlemen, we, we must make it easier and not harder for those students to study and work in the United States. Without these bright, talented, and creative minds, America will lose its economic and technological edge. The New York Times columnist Tom Friedman wrote about attending a graduation ceremony at Rensselaer Polytech, one of our science and engineering universities in this country. He watched as student after student received newly minted PhDs. He wrote that he could not help but notice that their names were Hang Lu, Tao Yan, Fu Tang. There is, of course, nothing wrong with that except for the fact that this new crop of foreign-born graduates would probably be returning to their native countries to help those booming economies. Again, nothing wrong with that. But because our Immigration and Naturalization Service had made it very hard for them to stay here. He wrote, I think any foreign student who gets a PhD in our country in any subject should be offered citizenship. I want them. The idea that we actually make it difficult for them to stay is crazy. He's right. At Illinois, as with most great research universities in this nation, we educate vast numbers of international graduate students, and fundamentally at the expense of the federal government. And then we tell them they have to go back. Friedman is right. Allow me one final story. My immigrant past came back full circle when our, our daughter got engaged and she needed a dress. Now this is typical New York. My wife Susan knew a friend of a friend of a friend who knew a tailor who made dresses for Vera Wang. We got this particular wedding dress for a song, Wholesale, because just like Woody Allen has famously remarked, in my family it was a crime to buy retail. <laughs> when we arrived at his loft, the tailor turned out to be an 80-year-old Holocaust survivor. All of a sudden, it was 40 years earlier when my grandfather had been a tailor and I had been sent to lofts in New York to get clothing from relatives, wholesale, of course. All the memories with my late grandparents came rushing back to me with great vividness. One of the great mysteries of our short lives is that we can never prepare for these moments, these century-filled triggers to our past. What set me back in time were the dust particles and the slant of the light through the loft windows, the way the tailor was bent over his work, the yellow tape draped over his back, pieces of chalk dust on his fingers, his glasses balanced on his nose, and the concentration, the staccato whirl of the sewing machine competing with the sounds of the city outside, stacks of raw fabric, scraps of my family's history, in fact, everything in that tailor's tiny loft. On that day, I stood there with my wife and my daughter, and I remembered where I came from. I remembered my courageous grandparents, may they rest in peace, landing at Ellis Island, the two of them not knowing what awaited them across New York Harbor, not knowing but trusting in America's great promise. It's a promise we must never break. Thank you.
Uh, this was precisely the message that I wanted you to hear from the Chancellor of the University of Illinois. Uh, our next speaker is my friend Martin Manilanson, and I'm going to. Well, good afternoon, or as they say in a lot of Asian and Asian American households, have you eaten? I know, <laughs> and I know you haven't, but I think we will be eating um, soon enough uh, with the great menu that um, I think is awaiting us. Uh, but I do hope your mind will be sati satiated, if you will, at least temporarily, by some of the things that we, we have been discussing here. And I'd like to thank Chancellor Herman for that really moving and enlightening um, talk. So in many ways, we are being fed um, right now. So OK, good. So we are a nation of immigrants, we'd like to tell ourselves. But in many ways, immigrants often um, invoke and provoke conflicting um, reactions and attitudes. Either we think of them, or we think of immigration and immigrants as a, a, as a cause for celebration or for denigration, a cause for jubilation or anxiety. But one way to at least ease, for a lot of people, one way to ease anxieties, not just about immigration, but about a lot of uh, other anxieties, is through food, right? We like to think of food as a replacement or a stand-in for a lot of things, and I won't go into that. Uh, I might get into some of them, but we'd like to think of immigrants and food in many ways, and um, to think of immigrants and their cultural differences um, and utilizing food as a vehicle to kind of bridge that, right? We like to use food as a metaphor for bigger things, such as nation, citizenship, and immigration, such as the melting pot. Right? We like to think of our country, some of us do, as um, all the immigrants being steered into this all-American stew, being incorporated, that's a sociological term, Social, um, incorporated, um, assimilated, and absorbed into the cultural and social melange. Right? That's a culinary term. But we also like to think of our nation as a salad bowl. Right? Um, each and everyone coming to settle in this country um, not being steered into an all-American stew, but rather be like these vegetables, um, independent, freestanding, with a light cultural dressing, if you will, but still separate individuals within a collective. Talk about running with the metaphors, right? Um, we like to think of food. To th um, we like to think of food in order to think about people, about uh, people and their difference. And so I think a lot of you have seen this time and time again in Iron Chef and all of these other shows. Uh, um, what you eat is what you are. And clearly, a lot of you believe that. And I somehow believe part of it. But I also think that um, it is a cliche that oftentimes math, if not um, totally, um, hides the complexity, um, uh, the complexity of, of uh, uh, the complexity and messy entanglements that stereotypes and icons that occur when we equate food, uh, I this kind of easy equivalent between food and identity, between food and people. And that's one of the things I'd like to complicate today. Like, for instance, like takeout. You know, takeout in, in the American sense typically has that other word, Chinese takeout, right? Um, the carton has become the emblem of takeout in, ma in, in so many ways. Um, the Chinese delivery man has become this urban icon, so much so that Seinfeld had made a, a, an entire um, episode around it. Um, and um, there's uh, Calvin Trillin, the, uh, the writer, uh, extolled um, and actually wax poetic about the lack of Chinese delivery man in, in, uh, in California, of all things, right? Um, but these, because they're so ubiquitous, right? They're so banal that we think of Sunday, like for some families, Sunday is take Chinese takeout night, right? So we also think of, um, you know, immigrants and the packed lunch. There are all these narratives about growing up immigrant. Uh, I'm sorry, the bento right there is not clearly a bento. Um, I mean, the, the imagery is not too clear, but it's a bento box, a lunch box. And there are a lot of stories about Asian Americans growing up saying, oh, you know, I didn't really like coming in with my lunchbox with rice. I really want American packed lunch, like sandwiches and all that, right? Uh, so these kinds of things come in with the idea that we are what we eat, right? And, and historians have told us about how um, Asians have been seen as the rice eaters. So conflicts between 
different people like in 19th century San Francisco, uh, people, the conflict between Chinese and Irish dock workers were seen in terms of the conflict between rice eaters and beef eaters, for instance. But um, more than rice eaters were seen as dog eaters, right? Eating raw fish. Until very recently, that was kind of a strange thing, but you now sushi is quite um, you know, banal too. But they always think of Asian cuisine as exotic and extreme, if you will, right? But I'd like to say that, in fact, these kinds of stereotypes kind of lend themselves, particularly in the popular imagination, where you equate bodies, raci you know, racialized bodies with food. And I'd like to like, quickly tell you about this, um, this controversial item in Details Magazine. If you've never seen Details Magazine, go take a quick peek. Um, they used to have a, a, a section called Anthropology, strangely enough. <laughs> I'm from anthropology, but they called it anthropology. And they typically have a man standing there. It's either cowboy or gay, um, European or gay. And in this, um, in this um, um, issue, it was Asian or gay. And you're saying, what does this have to do with food? Ah, uh, well, let me just say that, uh, in fact, in fact, one of the interesting things that this article by, um, well, the article is it's a blurb, um, actually included things like shrimp balls, masculinity, sushi, hairlessness, sexual prowess, fashion sense, and general cho chicken. So I leave you with those things and, and think them over, right? This rather tricky hodgepodge of food and how they, they were actually, you can see all these, these, uh, these numbers and it's actually a commentary on, on the, um, the physical and uh, physical features of of this man and, and kind of um, insinuating, you know, his kind of being gay, if you will, but through food metaphors, if you will, right? And food metaphors and stereotypes also occur in t-shirts in the same way as the controversial Abercrombie and Fitch uh, t-shirts that eventually um, were removed. Now, we're seeing in these couple of examples the way in which sexuality, race, and food um, lend themselves to a kind of exoticized and orientalized representation, particularly in um, recent popular um, media. And I think a lot of you know Padma Lakshmi, right? In Top Chef, right? Uh, and previous to Top Chef, Padma Lakshmi was um, a model ma uh, who was formerly married to Salman Rushdie, right? That was her claim to fame. Now she's called the easy exotic. Again, I leave that for you to ponder what it means, right? Um, but clearly, as we, as we go through all these images, there is that persistent um, kind of equation that I've been talking about between Asians and food that I think is, is, is quite interesting and disturbing at the same time. I'd like to move towards the, the imagery of Ming Tsai, who is one of the proponents of uh, fusion cuisine. And uh, Ming Tsai, is um, used to be the host of a now defunct show in the Food Channel called East Meets West. And fusion cuisine is, uh, for some people, for a lot of people, is seen as the East Meets West type of um, meeting of, um, of uh, ingredients and cooking techniques between Asia and the rest of the world. So you see all of these examples of fusion cuisine, and I can't tell you what they are. They're all fused in my mind. So. Um, <laughs> But in many ways, most people think of fusion cuisine, particularly uh, in terms of um, the rapid migration and globalization, right, with uh, the movement of people, particularly movement of people from, from Asia. And so in many ways, fusion cuisine is seen as a site of assimilation and domestication of difference. So that exotic thing out there can, be, can be par become part of you if, if, for instance, you create this moment of this meeting together of, of the East and the West, right? But according to Ming Tsai, too often fusion cuisine leads to confusion, if you will. And, and basically he's saying, well, it, it needs to find um, some kind of harmonious combination. But I'd like to think of fusion cuisine more critically because I'd like to think of it not so much as a culinary culture or, or a culinary technique or a fad or fashion, um, I would like to think of it in part as a triumph of an uncritical multiculturalism. That is, when you 
put people or uh, differences together in ways that um, don't create any kind of change. And I'd like to think of this in terms of, um, think of it more broadly historically, and I think uh, Jim would appreciate this, particularly in terms of the labor historical um, um, role that Asian Americans played in um, American food industries. Because technically, Americans came to these shores to work in uh, the agricultural industry in California and Hawaii. Uh, Filipinos and Chinese worked in the uh, salmon canneries in the early 20th century in Alaska and Washington, D.C. Southeast Asian Americans, Vietnamese, um, Cambodians, and particularly um, Vietnamese in um, the Gulf area uh, were among those that were devastated by Katrina because they were in, in part the, one of the major um, workers and laborers in the shrimp industry, right? So one of the things I wanted to, to point to in, in, in this kind of brief segue, because I've been told I need to be very brief, this, this little foray that I, I, I uh, did with the icons, the stereotypes, and fusion cuisine is to think of, uh, uh, to push you to think more broadly about food and difference, food, food and immigrants. For instance, um, historians have told us that um, immigrant communities have long been fusing or creolizing their cuisines. A lot of uh, immigrant mothers, for instance, in, in kitchens have long found new, new ways of incorporating techniques and ingredients um, into their so-called native dishes, right? Um, but I also want to point out that in many ways, um, food is, is kind of a false comfort for a lot of us in trying to deal with difference. It is a safe medium when we want to talk about cultural exchange because it seems to kind of bridge that difference with, but not really making any kind of real connection, if you will. Um, um, while still maintaining inequality. So in many ways, I think, and, and one of the things I've, uh, I tell my students in my big 209 class, is that contemporary American fascination with food, you know, with the Food Channel, with cookbooks, Iron Chef, uh, Chef Top Chef, all of these things are really, I think, uh, a symptom of the present historical moment, which is about containing difference rather than a critical exploration of difference and inequality. So at the end of the day, uh, what I want to come up, uh, come up with uh, in, this, in this quick presentation is to enable a critique of assimilation. Because most people think, well, assimilation is good, right? We think of an assimilation toward an all-Americanness. But what is all-Americanness? What is the mainstream? I would like to know, right? So that in many ways, um, we need to think more broadly. And as a way of ending, I'd like to end or I should I say begin, because I typically give my big class of 700 in 209 fortune cookies on the first day of class. And I typically get a memo from Lincoln Theater people because they typically leave a, a mess afterwards. But I give fortune cookies at the very beginning because I don't think they're like dessert, like they're the ending. They're actually about beginnings, right? Uh, I'm ending with the fortune cookie to use the symbol and icon, this symbol and icon, to exhort us to think of food not just a vehicle for, for pleasure, uh, but also as a way to be nourished by the long history of um, Asian American labor in food industries and the complex complexities of living with and through cultural and social differences and inequalities. Amidst the debates of closing the borders, if you will, and the tightening of the immigration process, I hope we not only think more critically about food, but also to think beyond it as we reflect the future of immigration and of immigrants in America today. Thank you. The next speaker is Jorge Chapa. Uh, the title of the book, uh, I had a good, 10 years ago, I started working on a research project with a group of really gifted colleagues, uh, studying Latino immigration in the rural Midwest. Um, that research project became the book, Apple Pie and Enchiladas. And the subtitle I crossed out, uh, my update of that project, uh, our dysfunctional immigration system at the breaking point. But today we were asked to make our talks very brief and to make them fun. So I want to talk about, as you see, foods as symbols in the immigration debate. And I want to talk about, here's the cover of our book. 
And I want to talk a little bit why, why we chose that title. Um, here in the cover, okay, so you can read it yourself. But you can picture up here uh, the typical Latino undocumented immigrant family. They're living there with this picture of a church in uh, somewhere in Indiana. I can't tell you the place names. Um, and below, uh, this is uh, the a sign for an entrance to a town also in Indiana. You can see, if you look closely here, it says, Welcome to it's Ligonier, this public domain. Because Ligonier was painted over and somebody stenciled in Mexico. And uh, I, I used this book and this slide in my class, and the student said, well, look, they're welcoming the Mexican immigrants. And I think that's an unusual reading of this. Uh, and I don't think it's quite, uh, there's really quite a welcoming sign. But I'm going to tell you about why the apple pie. Here it is. Uh, I hope these pictures help you uh, whet your appetite. Because I understand we have a really great spread uh, downstairs. And I'll be get, we'll help you get through soon. As part of this project, we're able to hire doctoral student ethnographers. The goal, we selected the... Uh, a, a handful of towns throughout the Midwest trying to get a sample of different types of towns with different histories and economies. One was in the apple growing region in northern Michigan. Our ethnographer, she lived there for several months, took notes, interviewed people, went to meetings. She uh, wrote in her field notes, she went to a charity auction. Again, this apple, the apple growers uh, were at the town, Hope Town was at a small, these are really rural towns, really isolated by, by our definition, by our standards. Uh, at a charity auction, a number of people had uh, baked pies for and to be auctioned off for charity. So all the apple growers were sitting, standing together. Someone presented a pecan pie for uh, the charity, and um, the apple growers were grumbling. We don't grow apples. We don't grow pecans here. We grow apples. It doesn't support, you know, by having pecan pie, you're not supporting the local economy. So the next uh, pie was an apple pie. And then, the, the, but the apple growers wouldn't bid on that either. That struck me as some, there's some kind of lesson there, but one in particular for a change that's happening in the rural Midwest. But also the larger symbol of, well, I'll, I'll get to in just a minute, about what's happening in our, in our country, about wanting to have it both ways and just really about the impossibility of that. But of course, uh, apple pie, even though originated in Europe at, at least a thousand years ago, uh, Chaucer mentioned apple pie in his pen. Uh, it's see, typically is the icon of American culture. You know the saying you heard a million times, I'm sure, as American as apple pie. So I told my uh, co-author, we got to uh, talk about apple pie in, the, in our title. There's a, a theme because when we're talking about this change and the Midwestern towns we studied were before the wave of Latino immigration and that we were uh, there in the field at the time when the 99, 2000, 2001, Latino immigration was uh, the wave, a huge wave that's kind of coming over these towns, that many of which had, had not seen Latinos in great numbers before. Here's the metaphor that, here's for the rural heartlands, again, another phrase we use in our title. This is something we're trying to communicate. So why, okay, let's see. Here's enchiladas, okay? I mean, it's a, for those of you who don't know, I'm sure you do, a tortilla with a chili sauce with some kind of filling. And again, okay, not only, well, it is my, one of my favorite foods, and certainly a typical Mexican food, but that's not why we chose it. Here, at the time, again, this is the early part of the century, uh, well, here you can read the quote. Uh, the earliest use I could find the phrase a whole enchilada, well, I, I found this, in 1969, Trini Lopez released an album that is called The Whole Enchilada, and it's for, certainly the phrase goes back before that, but in the context of the Reeks contemporary immigration, Jorge Casaneda, at that time, former minister of Mexico said, about immigration reform, what now called comprehensive immigration reform, he wanted the whole enchilada. That is, a path to citizenship, benefits, really to make Mexican, well, again, in this case, specifically Mexican immigrants, have the similar status that immigrants have had as they come to the U.S., um, throughout our history. The whole, and he said, the whole enchilada or nothing. Now, I had some, in terms of the title, I want to say I've had some success as a designer of book covers and titles. One earlier publication, I was really proud. This is uh, my first book, in fact. The cover, I suggested the use of this uh, painting by Diego Rivera. 
that also helped come up with the title. And I, the title, and I thought this picture was a uh, perfect expression of the theme of the book that in many states, in many parts of this country, young Latinos are a major part of the workforce and they're carrying the whole country, especially as uh, the baby boom retires, going to be carrying the, the country uh, economically. So I suggested, we thought, okay, we came up with the title, and Ann, my, 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 uh, we were, uh, I remember this day, we were on the computer, on the phone for hours, and I said, apple pie, apple pie, apple pie, and enchiladas. So the question was, what kind of graphic? And I suggested, well, apple was a beautiful piece of apple pie, or maybe a pi beautiful picture of pie. For the enchiladas, uh, I said, well, I suggested, and I'm not going to show you a picture of this because it's pretty gross, of ha half-eaten plate of enchiladas. And certainly, we're far from the whole enchilada that Jorge Castaneda wanted. Maybe with some cigarettes about smashed out in it or something other <laughs> way to defile. Because I think, to me, that symbolizes the situation that many Latino immigrants face. But I'm going to leave you with one more image. And here's just a piece of cake, a cake, as could be. I've looked at hundreds of pictures of cake, and this is a cake. Uh, but I think the situation we have with Latino immigration, like many others, and by the way, can't help be helped struck by the same problems with our finances right now. We're in the situation of wanting to have our cake and eat it too. And I just can't have it both ways. And I think we really need to think about that as we think about immigration, both here and in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, I want you to pretend like you are listening to me on the radio because I was asked to prepare basically a commentary, one of my radio commentaries for this. And so I'm going to pretend like I'm in the studio and you should pretend like you're listening to me on the radio. I have brought some visual aids though to make it less boring. I am a third generation American. My grandparents on my Polish or my father's side came here from Poland when they were teens. And I'm very nearly third generation on my mother's side. My grandmother was born here only about two years after my Hungarian great-grandparents arrived on these shores. So I know a bit about food from the old country. If you have Eastern European roots like me, that kind of food might mean dried mushrooms that mysteriously arrived in the mail from relatives in Poland and blossomed into mushroom soup. Noodle pockets called pierogies filled with potato and cheese or sauerkraut. Chicken paprikash, a delicious melt-in-your-mouth blend of chicken, sour cream, and paprika. And finally, of course, oleo. You know, oleo, that cheap substitute for butter that working class people like both sets of my grandparents could afford. My grandma Lahotsky swore by it. It was her secret ingredient in just about everything. Oleo gave a certain sweetness to the little dumplings that my grandma called nokedly. Real butter, even today, doesn't have the same je ne sais pas as oleo. Oleo, perhaps surprisingly, is an important part of my talk, a very brief overview of the way the law has looked at certain foods and immigrants. Because as much as my grandma loved oleo, the law despised it. Allow me to digress for just a moment to better set the stage for the oleo battle. The time I'm talking about here is the 1800s, years before my family arrived on the shores of the United States to work in the car factories of Detroit and the steel mills of Pittsburgh. As far as I know, only my paternal grandmother came from a vaguely privileged background. She was the daughter of a local politician and vet veterinarian in Poland and came here with two of her sisters to seek her fortune. She's the one there on the right. She met my grandfather shortly thereafter. He came to the States with very little money and family history goes, was sitting on railroad tracks crying at about age 16, unable to speak English and in need of a job. A man happened by and as they would say, through God's good grace, offered him work. My mother's parents and grandparents have a similar history. I tell you this so that you understand that we as a family always ate food of the commoners. Poppy seed rolls, cabbage and noodles, a white sausage we called kishka, herring, sour cream and cucumbers, stuffed cabbage, and stujanina. 
That's a gelatinous loaf made of unmentionable pig parts for the non-poles out there. I love all this food, but you can imagine that it and food like it didn't sit well with people who'd been in the United States for generations and who had what some would call a more discerning palate. Cabbage and noodles, herring, and most distressing of all, stew Janina? What's that about? When Congress had to decide who should be allowed into the United States, it was pretty easy to see which groups were causing the most trouble. It was, as the Supreme Court put it in 1892, an influx of cheap, unskilled labor. These people, Congress explained, care nothing about our American institutions and, in many instances, never even heard of them. They are ignorant of our social conditions, and they are generally from the lowest social stratum in Europe. But what these immigrants ate also entered into the congressional debate about immigration toward the end of the 1800s. To show just how far apart these newcomers were from real Americans, members of Congress explained that foreign-born laborers live upon the coarsest of food. Uh, there was no need to explain this more fully, apparently. Everybody must have already heard about Stu Janina. Congress would later ban another immigrant's food product, a drink known as filled milk. Filled milk was a concoction made by extracting butter fat from milk and replacing it with vegetable fat. It was sold in little cans, just like the evaporated milk my grandma Gaida would give me for a special treat when I was a little girl. And it was precisely people like my grandma and me that Congress claimed it was trying to protect when it banned filled milk. Here's a quote from an activist who testified before Congress. These Italian mothers that buy the filled milk cannot read the labels, but it is recommended by their grocers, and they will buy it and give it to their children. They have been known to give coffee and tea to their children. The children come back from school and say why we must have milk, and they, the Italian mothers, will buy the cheapest product they can get. She and other anti-filled milk advocates were very persuasive. The filled milk ban is still a part of the federal law today. But one person's coarse cuisine is another's beloved babka, a Polish bread. Ultimately, Congress couldn't keep the immigrants out, and the immigrants bought their foods with them. To be fair, the law sometimes tried to understand what these new foods were and how we might all live in harmony with them and their coarseness. In 1944, a court listened as an expert in home economics explained what chickpeas are and how they're cooked. The expert testified that she had a friend who actually served ethnic food in her home, and it's there that the expert often dined upon this strange food known as chickpeas. There's a case from the 30s that explores pine nuts in much the same way. A few years before, a California court forced immigration authorities to allow an immigrant from China into the United States, despite concerns that she was a debauched woman. Debauched, the court reasoned, could mean a lot of things, including uh, intemperance in food. And therefore, the state statute initially used to keep her out was too sweeping in its terms. And the law even ventured back to the old country to put current legislative movements in context. The state Supreme Court found Indiana's attempt in the mid-1800s to end all liquor sales as unconstitutional, based in part on an expert's testimony that he had been to France itself, and despite the country's ample wine supply, had seen very little rudeness or broil or meanness or indecency in clothing among the French, <laughs> except in Paris. <laughs> to make the legislative restriction more understandable to the non-immigrant masses, the court warned with a shudder that next to be banned might be cornbread, ham, and eggs. So that's a bit of the groundwork for the oleo dispute. Cornbread, ham, and eggs would never be banned. But oleo, that coarse butter substitute, much beloved by my Pennsylvania-born Grandma Lahotsky would. Here's the language from the Pennsylvania anti-oleo law. No person shall manufacture out of any oleaginous substance any article designed to take the place of butter. And this wasn't just a civil matter, mind you. The statute made it a crime to do so. 
as one Virginia Port Court put it, at the time of the arrest of the accused, he had in his possession for sale and was selling in the original unbroken and imported package, the article known as oleo margarine. One thing's certain, the anti-oleo lobby had a great success in many state legislatures and in some courts. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court upheld the wayward shopkeeper's criminal conviction for selling imitation butter as a food product over a far more understanding dissent that pointed out that oleo was a staple for hardworking folks from the old country who couldn't afford butter and who sometimes lived only on buckwheat and lard anyway. No one would think to ban those staples. But finally, oleo had an important victory. The United States Supreme Court found that all state laws that banned oleo were unconstitutional. Oleo margarine could finally feel like a king. One fact that the court relied on, oleo's been around in the old country for at least 25 years and everybody's doing just fine there. So my grandma slathered her nakedly with oleo. Though she likely didn't know it, it was a tribute both to her immigrant roots and to the substitute's hard-fought battle against the buttered-up establishment. She also kept meat grease in a can on the counter in the kitchen, and I'm sure the authorities would have liked to have learned about a product she made by leaving what I think was a slab of bacon unrefrigerated for a few days, as I recall. She called it abalt salina. And remember filled milk, similar to my other beloved grandma's special treat? Even though the Filled Milk Act is still on the books today, in the 1970s, the Food and Drug Administration decided not to enforce the law anymore. So today, they say, one can buy filled milk again, and it's all come back around to immigrants. Filled milk, it's available mostly in Asian grocery stores. Thank you. Um. We want to see if uh, there are some questions and a little bit of discussion. Uh, to remind those of you who are not familiar with the usual setup here, you do need to go to that microphone uh, because this is being taped and will be streamed, uh, video streamed. And please don't let the fact that there's a huge amount of luscious food downstairs inhibit you from asking any questions. Uh, no, we, we, would, we would actually like to see if anybody has any questions or discussion. Yes, please, just go to the microphone. Hi, uh, Ray Nace and I graduated in 88 in electrical engineering. Uh, I have a question for the chancellor as far as the uh, international students that have come in to the university. I was curious as to what percentage are actually international students and what are actually, how many are able to stay here in the States and work and how many leave and go back? Well, okay, a uh, complex question partly because it needs to be uh, broken really uh, and should be broken into the undergraduate and graduate population. The, uh, um, in fact, the, the newsworthy story, if you will, uh, from the point of view of those who are uh, against this, uh, the, having more international students is really at the undergraduate level because the, the way the argument is being framed, you know, it's one in-state student for one out-of-state student, which is ultimately a foolish way to think of it. But if, if you look at, at that, uh, the um, out-of-country population uh, is in this year's freshman class around 12%. Uh, and the, one of the interesting things that, that I find is that uh, many of these individuals have gone to high schools here in the United States. That's a new phenomenon. I don't have the number from this year, but last year there were 450 international students and 180 had gone to school in the United States. I, I'm trying to get those data as we speak. Now, uh, people can uh, choose to stay to go on to graduate education. I mean, that, that's one way to stay, but the visa re generally requires you to go back. Uh, at the graduate level, it becomes a different issue. Uh, I th think we're about, uh, and it's going to depend on the discipline, around over 50%. In some PhD programs, it's 75%. Uh, the, um, uh, and many of these individuals simply just cannot stay. 
Uh, I mean, if they go to a university, universities are exempt from the H-1B Visa Act. Okay, so we can we can hire international faculty, but very often, and I know my, my own experience as a department head was uh, the only way to hire uh, this. This was in '88. It's a little easier now that you the individual would have had to go back unless you could get their visa changed, which uh, Chinese at that time, there were, we got one of five visas that were, were changed in the entire year. But my, the, what I find ironic is that um, the cost of educating somebody for six years off of a federal grant, for instance, if we just look at science and technology, could be the order of $200,000 a year and we have wonderfully talented individuals, and then we, we tell them to go home. So I think the percentage will vary university to university, but for the most part, you have to go back. Other questions? Yes, please. Yes, Ryan. thank you. Uh, I also have a question for the chancellor. Um, I am a member of the graduate I'm, employees. I'm, I'm hungry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, um, no, go ahead. I'm kidding. Uh, I'm a member of the Graduate Employees Organization. I'm a uh, PhD candidate in the Department of Communication. Okay. Um, and uh, I believe in your, in your talk you uh, alluded to the CVIS fee, uh, which is charged uh, to international students uh, by the federal government uh, so that they can basically pay for their own surveillance uh, since 9-11. Actually, um, I, I didn't allude to it, but if you want to oh, bring it up, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, given the sympathies that uh, you seem to make clear that you have uh, with uh, international students, with uh, immigration issues. I'm wondering if you will commit to uh, ensuring that, as other universities have done, that that fee does not fall on international students, but will be covered by the university. Well, that's something we, we consider from time to time. I'm, uh, actually, I'm, I'm in, in a very real sense, concerned about benefits for all graduate students. So I'm not going to commit to any particular thing, but uh, I think we've made it uh, pretty clear that we care deeply about our graduate students and are determined to do something for all of them. Uh, whether or not this is the right particular action does get considered from, from time to time. Thanks. Hi, I'm Maury Montgomery. I'm a visiting scholar from New Zealand, and I'm in the International Forum for United States Studies. I teach American Studies at the University of Canterbury, New Zealand, and one of my areas is ethnicity and identity, and I've greatly enjoyed the presentations here, just super. Um, one of the things I think that is very problematic about um, the, the flow of peoples at the moment is this other uh, problem with regards to the drain that is occurring um, to the countries that are sending people to the economies where there are jobs, uh, where they might well indeed enjoy a, a better lifestyle. And one of the things that we're very aware of in New Zealand is that we're draining the Pacific Islands. And um, it, it could get to the stage where they're not sustainable. And uh, on the one hand, you might well lament um, that people don't go back to their countries after they have been trained here. But uh, to some extent, we need them uh, to come back. And so I'm not in favor of there um, being a compulsion uh, to return. I think that that, uh, that is entirely unnecessary. But I think we do need to be mindful in terms of the, the movement of peoples, in terms of the global economy and its health as a whole, um, that, um, that there has to be some kind of modifying effect on this sucking of, of people as, as we have a, a dip in, in the demography, certainly in the West, with regards to the people um, who, have, who have skills and who contribute um, greatly to the future. Let me just see if uh, any of the speakers would like to respond. I, the impression that I have is that everyone appreciated the, uh, the remark and uh, there doesn't seem to be much disagreement. Um, just one short plug for the approach that you're suggesting. It's common and maybe understandable to a certain extent that when we look at immigration, we look at it almost exclusively in terms of its impact in the United States and I think what your remark is encouraging us to do is to take a more global kind of perspective. And I think when you do that, it really opens up a lot of these uh, questions. 
Um, any other remarks or questions? Yes, please. Another immigrant. <laughs> I was uh, raised in Greece, and my parents would send me as a seven, eight-year-old buy beer, wine, and I was able to do so because there's no limit, uh, age limit. And uh, one of our, our former chancellor, Nancy Cantor, recently uh, joined an initiative asking that the drinking age uh, at American universities uh, to be reduced. And I want to ask Chancellor Herman what's his view on this and whether he supports this initiative. Thanks. <laughs> No. <laughs> but, what? No, I, the, um, look, I, I appreciate the issue of, uh, you know, getting a, a slaked wine when one is a youth. And uh, I think things vary culture by culture. But uh, the reference is particular to the Amethyst Initiative. And uh, which has been signed on to by some, I think about 120 presidents, chancellors of universities. Um, most actually, interestingly, small private schools. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. I think uh, if you look at the uh, national highway data, if you look at the, uh, you see immediately that when their drinking age was uh, raised, uh, accidents lessened. If you look at the incidence of, uh, of violence uh, towards women on campuses and check back to see whether those individuals were drunk or uh, having abused alcohol, you see a high correlation. I see no data whatsoever that point to the benefit of lowering the drinking age. Our safety is at hand. Thanks very much to everyone. Uh, I think this might be a good opportunity to uh, head downstairs for some food. But before you do, sorry, can you just uh, help me thank our speakers today? Everyone did a wonderful job. Thank you.